Olá! This is a new chapter. Acts chapter 14. This is a short chapter, not too long, unlike the prior chapter. Six studies and what, 11, 12 hours? We won't spend as long in chapter 14. I will endeavor to make this first lesson light. Ten verses. This is New Testament video 371, Acts lesson 47. Dear Father God, May the Holy Spirit edify, encourage, and enlighten us. And may Thou alone be glorified. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Acts chapter 14, the first... Ten verses. Acts 14, 1. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews, and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made, both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews, with their rulers, to use them despitefully, and to stone them, they were aware of it, and fled unto Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lycaonia, and unto the region that lieth round about. And there they preached the gospel. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. Acts 14, verses 1 through 10. Our goal in this study 
is to expound, explain those opening ten verses we will recall, I hope, this is the first apostolic journey of Paul and Barnabas. What began in chapter 13 continues in 14. The first apostolic journey of Paul and Barnabas. We will recall Back in 13, chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas and John Mark and others, company and company, departed Antioch, Syria, right here. When the Holy Ghost ordered them to ministry elsewhere, not as missionaries, but as apostles. Saul and Barnabas, apostles. They sailed down the Arontis River to Seleucia the port, entered the Mediterranean Sea. This is chapter 13 landed on Cyprus, Salamis on the east, and Paphos on the west. They sailed to the mainland of Asia Minor, modern Turkey, Perga in Pamphylia. They moved to Antioch of Pisidia here, They preached in Antioch of Pisidia, in the synagogue. Paul had that long discourse in Antioch of Pisidia, in the synagogue. Although there were believing Jews and Gentiles, there were also unbelieving Jews who caused trouble for Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas flee Antioch in Pisidia. This is the region of Galatia. And they come to the area of Iconium, right here. Konya, today. Modern Konya. K-O-N-Y-A. Iconium. Lystra, to the south. Derby, to the south east. They will loop around and return to Antioch, Syria at the close of chapter 14. Thus concludes their first apostolic, not missionary, journey. Acts 13. They left Antioch of Pisidia. Verse 51.
they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium. Chapter 14, verse 1, And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, another synagogue, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. Visiting another synagogue. They did it in chapter 13, Antioch of Pisidia. And now Iconium. Why is Paul preaching in the synagogues? Again, three full purpose. One, to win any lost Jews gathered in those synagogues, win them to Christ. Preach the gospel of the grace of God to them. The Jewish people, even to this day, gather in the synagogues to hear, to learn spiritual concepts. Now, yes, there are a lot of Traditions, just like in Christendom, dumb. But the synagogues, as Jesus Christ knew in his earthly ministry, as the Apostle Paul knows, as the Apostle Barnabas knows, the Jewish people have a simple on these Sabbath days, Saturday Sabbath days, to be religious. This is when and where they are most receptive to spiritual truth. Paul, who is knowledgeable of the Hebrew Bible, as a lost man he was a rabbinical scholar, now as a saved man he has more spiritual light than ever. And those lost Jews gathering in the synagogues they're in darkness. But the Holy Spirit, through Paul and Barnabas and the rest of their company, talks to them. Israel in the promised land said no thanks to Jesus Christ. Whether Peter's ministry or Paul's earlier ministry. So now Israel scattered out of the promised land the dispersed Israelites, Jewish people they have opportunity. You can trust Jesus Christ or be lumped together with your unbelieving nation back in Palestine. Your choice. 
Israel in the land and out of the land, or without excuse. That's number two. Why Paul is visiting the synagogues to leave apostate Israel without excuse. Three. Paul is announcing to apostate Israel, notifying them there has been a change in program. And God is now reaching the Gentile world, not through your nation, but through my ministry. In spite of Israel's unbelief, salvation and blessing are going to the Gentiles. A radical departure from prophecy, huh? the prophetic program. So Paul and Barnabas expelled, thrown out of the borders of Antioch in Pisidia, the close of Acts 13. Now, they arrive in Iconium, Acts 14.1, Iconium. Iconium is roughly 75 miles 120 kilometers to the east of Antioch in Pisidia. Still in the territory of Galatia, central modern Turkey. These are real places. These are real people. This is historical. This is literal. Acts 14.1 It came to pass in Iconium that they went both together Paul and Barnabas verse 50 of chapter 13 Paul and Barnabas both went together into the synagogue of the Jews and so spake that a great multitude both of the Jews and also of the Greeks Believed. Jews and Gentiles are joining the church, the body of Christ. Believing Paul's gospel. The gospel of the grace of God. Look at verse 3. Long time therefore abode they, speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. The word of God's grace, the grace message, in contradistinction to the law of Moses. Acts 13, 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Paul's sermon through this man, Jesus Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe, not work, see, not do good deeds, not join the local church, not those who are water baptized, 
or give tithes and offerings, or kneel at the altar and beg for mercy, are those who uh, repent of their sins, turn for their sins, oh, I'm so sorry. All that believe, no exceptions. The salvation of God is available to all Jews and all Gentiles. Paul has an all man message. No difference. They're all in unbelief. God has mercy on all. None of them deserve it. All that believe, all that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Perform, performance, based acceptance system. Mm -mm. Sinners cannot perform. That's what sin is. Sinners need the grace-based acceptance system. God accepts us in Christ, not because of what we do or don't do, but because of what Jesus Christ did at Calvary's cross. Acts 13, 43. Now, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the law of Moses, no, the grace of God. The law, any law system, any performance system, will not make right sinners, will not make sinners right, justified in God's sight, righteous in God's sight. Nope. The law does just the opposite. It shows us we are unrighteous. <gasps> yes, it's true. Mm -hmm. You mean all my religious goodness is worthless? Yes. And so is mine. The Apostle Paul, a religious man and lost man, learned in Acts 9 about the futility of works religion. If I will ever receive anything from God, it will be because of His goodness, not mine. Read Philippians 3. Saul of Tarsus. Not my righteousness. But Christ's righteousness. That's what matters. The grace of God, not the law, grace. 
Acts 20, 24. Acts 20, verse 24. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the kingdom. No. The gospel of the grace of God. There is Paul's gospel. The gospel of the grace of God. The dispensation of the grace of God was given to Paul for our benefit. Ephesians 3, verses 1 and 2. Don't misunderstand. In Genesis 6, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Oh, Brother Sean, God was manifesting His grace before Paul. Oh, amen to that. Amen. Or there wouldn't have been a human race to be around when Paul conducted his ministry. God would have consumed this whole planet long before Paul. However, grace during a dispensation is not to be confounded with the dispensation of grace. The dispensation of grace in a summary form, is this. God's house rules. During Paul's ministry, are these. I will not reckon the world's trespasses unto it. Impute the world's trespasses unto it. I will be gracious. I will give the world what they do not deserve. What it doesn't deserve. This is because of Calvary. I will do this. I will reach the world through the Apostle Paul, based on the fact Christ died for the sins of the world. And I will hold back the wrath and the judgment that should have already come in Acts, but didn't. But didn't. That grace is the means whereby sinners who were destined for the wrath is the means whereby those sinners can trust Christ's finished cross work, thereby join the church, the body of Christ, and be spared the wrath to come. The dispensation of the grace of God. At the heart of the dispensation of the grace of God, Ephesians 3, 2, is the gospel of the grace of God, Acts 20, 24. Now, what is the gospel of the grace of God? First, Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15. 
Verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. This is the gospel of grace, the gospel of the grace of God, Paul's gospel, the only valid gospel today. It is such a pity that countless preachers, teachers, priests talk, 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 talk about the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. <laughs> and they never bother to read 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Maybe they'll quote Romans 10, 9 and 10, or John 3, 16, Acts 2, 38. I want to forget that one. Or they'll go to Mark 1, repent and believe the gospel. <laughs> Except that's another gospel. Again, repeat it. Repeat. Repetition is the mother of all learning. The gospel of grace. The gospel of the grace of God. Is most clearly laid out in a condensed form. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. If you want to see an expanded form... Read the first five chapters of Romans, the book of Romans. That is the clearest gospel tract ever written. Romans chapters 1 to 5. God's grace. Christ died for our sins. Grace is what God can do for sinners, for us, because they, we, are unable to do anything for Him. We cannot please God with our works. It doesn't matter how many good works, how noble they are, how often we've received the praise of men for them. It doesn't matter. God is not impressed except with the sacrifice, the perfect, sinless sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ here Calvary's cross mm -hmm. we could do nothing that's why Christ came and did it all for us our substitute, substitutionary atonement. Now, just as we can converse with 
works religionists today and share the gospel of grace with them. And they'll argue, but I've done this and I've done that, and if no one... like me is going to heaven, then no one's going to heaven. If I'm not going to heaven, no one is. I've done so many good works. I don't need Jesus. Or, well, yeah, I do need some help. Let me do the best I can and Jesus will take up the balance. You can't tell me I can't offer God something. The flesh is a performer. Perform. Because then the flesh can boast, I did something to please God. I had a hand in receiving a blessing. Well, the apostles faced a similar ministry challenge. Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry did too. The Jewish works religionists clung to their traditions of men, their piety, we don't need a savior, we can save ourselves, See? that's all deception, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it, God knows it, Jeremiah 17, 9. Sin deceives. When Paul and Barnabas were preaching in those synagogues and the Jewish works religionists who did not believe they needed a Savior heard they needed a savior. Yeah. We will ensure Paul and Barnabas are promptly escorted out of here. We will go to whatever lengths are necessary to drive out the Word of God from our midst. They fight with Paul and Barnabas. And do not forget, Paul as Saul of Tarsus did the same thing before Acts 9. So Paul is preaching. Paul and Barnabas are in the synagogue of the Jews there in Iconium. Acts 14, 1. They spake, they so spake the gospel of grace. Christ died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. That a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Gentiles, believed. There's some new members of the church, the body of Christ. Here is an interesting quote. Written long ago. The power was
was in the message they preached, not the moving praise and worship service. Hmm. See, the emphasis is on preaching here, speaking. Speaking, preaching the Word of God. This is not about stirring emotions and tickling ears. This is about convicting lost hearts. You need a Savior. You need Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you'll die in your sins and go to an eternal lake of fire forever, permanently. The finality of that. By the way, your works can't help you either. Even the law of Moses even God's word to Israel through Moses can't save you. You mean our family religion that we've had for 1,500 plus years? Can't deliver us from our sins? Yes, that's what I'm telling you. Israel had watered down the law, so they didn't fully appreciate the lesson the law would have taught them had they kept the law pure. Instead, they watered it down with opinions, speculations, rabbinical Conjectures, traditions of men. Okay. That is not difficult to fathom at all. Look at Christendom. Do we use the Bible alone in the professing church today? Why, of course, we'll use the Bible here and there. We can't pass ourselves off. As Christians, if we don't quote some New Testament verses. But as for those inconvenient ones, we can discard those. Poor translation, not in the original manuscripts. Looking at how professional religious leaders treat the scriptures today. I have no difficulty at all seeing how Israel's ancient religious leaders did it. Not at all. Acts 14, verse 2. Remember, this is a recurring fact of the book of Acts. When God works, the world, the flesh, and the devil are at hand to distract, destroy, interfere. Fruitful time in ministry In chapter 13, did you see the hassles too? Chapter 14, there's more of it. Acts 14, 2. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles 
and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Hmm. Reminiscent of chapter 13, verse 44. And the next Sabbath day, Antioch of Pisidia, came also the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Verse 50, But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. They shook off the dust of their feet against them. It came to Iconium. Now in Iconium, trouble. Perhaps some of the unbelieving Jews in Antioch of Pisidia have traveled with them. Way off from Antioch of Pisidia, They've come to Iconium three or four days journey hmm the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles exciting them agitating them and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Remember Bar Jesus Elimus, Acts 13, the sorcerer, the false prophet, the Jew. He did his absolute best to prevent. Barnabas and Paul from reaching Sergius Paulus, a Gentile. Sergius Paulus desired to hear God's word. For Jesus Elimus, not only is he not interested in the truth, he seeks to turn others from it, too. That is a picture of apostate Israel harassing Paul and company for the remainder of Acts. Do you see it again? All through Acts 13, Acts 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Go on and on and on to Acts 28. Israel is in unbelief. There is true, the believing remnant, in the prophetic program, the little flock. It is true, there is a believing remnant of Jews. In Paul's ministry, those are members of the body of Christ. But overall, the Jewish people are in unbelief. Even today. First Thessalonians 2. Be mindful of 1 Thessalonians 2 whenever you read in Acts where Paul is preaching, Gentiles are believing, and Jews are opposing, hindering, bothering, Disrupting. 
1 Thessalonians 2, 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. These are Gentiles, believing Gentiles, in Paul's ministry, in Thessalonica, it's northern Greece, Macedonia. 14. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. Now there's the little flock. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved to fill up their sins all way, all the way. For the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. Paul's ministry in Acts. It's not easy, carefree living. Read Acts. If you serve the Lord, all your troubles disappear. Huh? Don't think so. One, I read something else in the Bible, and two, I see something else in my own life. Mm -hmm. Acts 14, 2. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Poisoning their minds. Generating hatred, strife, Discord here. I can just imagine what these unbelieving Jews are saying to these Gentiles. Listen to the false charges today. Paul isn't an apostle. You're not under the grace of God. You're under the law of God. See, the law of Moses. You're under the law, not grace. Mm -hmm. We're still in prophecy. Not mystery. All this confusion. Unbelieving Jews are the source of this opposition. Acts 14.3 Long time, therefore, abode they, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Despite the troubles, the persecution, 
the antagonism, hostility. Paul and Barnabas stay in Iconium. We will not be driven out. They speak boldly in the Lord. That's where true strength is. And they need all the courage they can get. Where is their boldness? In the Lord. Stay with it. Even in the difficult circumstances, Paul and Barnabas are faithful. Acts 14.3 Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. The word of his grace, God bears record of, he gave testimony to, he bore witness of, he's validating, endorsing, authenticating, substantiating the word of his grace. Acts 20, 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. The word of God's grace. Acts 14, 3. And the Lord granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Paul and Barnabas work miracles, signs and wonders. Now, remember... Paul is working under a new commission, a new dispensation. It's 15 years old, but it's still relatively new. At the time of Acts 14, we're still in the transitional period. That's the rest of Acts. Paul and Barnabas perform signs and wonders. Signs signify something. Sign, signify, signify. Wonders. They are... Miracles to grab attention and elicit prompt wonder, amazement. Wonders, see? Paul and Barnabas need authenticating miracles. Confirmation. Number one. Firstly, Paul and Barnabas are working miracles because of 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12. Verse 12. Truly, the signs of an apostle 
were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. The signs of an apostle. Remember, Jesus' is earthly ministry. A couple of verses. Matthew. Matthew 4, 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. Matthew 10, the commissioning of the twelve apostles. Verse 5, these twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as ye go preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye have received, freely give. Jesus is preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and he has authenticating miracles to confirm the message. So do his twelve apostles, preaching the same gospel of the kingdom. Here are the signs of an apostle. See that? Matthew 10, verse 8. Mark 16. Mark 16, verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere of the Lord, working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. That's early Acts. Early Acts. Luke 8. Luke 8, 1. And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. Preaching and showing the glad tidings. Gospel good news of the kingdom of God. With miracles. See that? Miracle working power. Acts 2. Acts 2, 43. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Chapter 4. Verse 30, they're praying, By stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. Acts 5, 12, And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. Verse 15, Insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about into Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. Whether Christ in his earthly ministry, Peter and the eleven in early Acts, those miracles are validating, confirming, communicating. The gospel of the kingdom truths in 
that literal, physical, visible, earthly, Davidic, Israeli kingdom, right here, that Jesus Christ will found one day, there will be no sickness, no devil possession, and so on. If the apostles, if Jesus Christ and his apostles were performing miracles, it only makes sense for Paul to perform miracles too. The miracles validate Paul's ministry as they did Jesus' earthly ministry and the twelve apostles' ministry before Paul. Okay. This is done in light of 1 Corinthians 1. The second reason for Paul's miracle working. 1 Corinthians 1, 22. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. John 4, verse 48. Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. In the book of Psalms, Psalm 74, verse 9, Israel says, We see not our signs. Signs are the national birthright of Israel, not the church, the body of Christ. Israel is God's sign nation. The Jewish people need proof the God of Israel is working. So there are miracles there. In order for Israel to recognize their God is now ministering to the world through Paul, Paul has the signs accompanying his ministry. The signs signify to Israel God has left you. And is saving and blessing the world apart from your kingdom program through Paul's ministry. Through the gospel of grace. Without you in your kingdom. Thirdly, Paul has miracles to confirm or validate his Gentile apostleship. These miracles are wrought among the Gentiles in order to confirm Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. Israel definitely notices why, yes, there is a change in program. Our miracles are now with the Gentiles. First Corinthians 12, for example, in the early body of Christ, exercising spiritual gifts for Israel's, 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 Israel's benefit. During Acts, Acts 15, verse 12. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. Israel hears of Barnabas and Paul 
and God's miracles and wonders wrought among the Gentiles. See that? It, it's so clear. Try it again. Romans 15. There's no reason for struggling with any of this. This is simple. It's not hard. Why did God make the Bible so difficult? we trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior? That He paid the price for our sins in full and we trust Him and Him alone in our heart? We have the indwelling Holy Spirit then. The same Holy Spirit who inspired these scriptures lives in us, the believers. We have the Holy Spirit as our teacher. 1 Corinthians 2. When we rely on our human intellect, natural man thinking, philosophy, traditions of men, see, now that is where The dark clouds and the mists and the fogs come into play. No longer are we listening to the Holy Spirit teach us through these written words, but now we're looking at those words with denominational eyeglasses. I don't understand. Oh, now I do. See? Take off the denominational eyeglasses. Years ago, I did. I have no interest in wearing them again. When we take the King James Bible and rightly divide it, scriptural truths are all oh, so plain. Dispensational Bible study is the key to understanding and enjoying the Bible. If we choose to approach the scriptures rightly defined, dispensationally, it will come at a price. we will have to relinquish our church traditions. Oh, I don't want to do it. I have invested too much time, energy, education with my denomination. But just remember, my friend, 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God. Unto God? Not unto men. Not unto the denomination, the cult, the sect, the seminary professor, the priest, the teacher, the deacon, the pope. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, Rightly dividing the word of truth. Bible study is work 
A workman, huh? Work. This is not entertainment time. Praise and worship. Oh, we had such a blessing today. We were in God's presence. Now listen. That's the flesh. The Spirit of God leads us to study the Scriptures rightly divided. We're reading Bible verses in their contexts. We're thinking this isn't mindless religion. We are comparing verses. And we are mindful of what is written to and about us and what is merely written for us. Okay. Sound Bible doctrine. Remember, we just read that. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 the word of God effectually worketh in them that believe. Them that believe. We have to know what we believe. It is important what we believe. How do we know what we should believe? Uh, Bible study? Bible study? Bible study will profit us far more in eternity than the toe tapping And the hand raising and the finger snapping. The Word of God will work in us as the Spirit of God takes what we've learned from the Word of God. And if we haven't learned anything from the Bible, it can't work in us, can it? See? Moving along. <laughs> I need to finish those verses in Acts 14. And if I don't resume teaching in Acts 14, this study will become longer and longer and longer. Romans 15. Paul and miracles. Romans 15. Verse 18, For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not brought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed through mighty signs and wonders. Gentiles, mighty signs and wonders, by the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. The Gentiles, by seeing Israel's signs among them, the Gentiles, the Gentiles realized Israel's God is with us. There is a change in program. What Israel's God was working. With the twelve apostles, Those same miracles are with Paul. See? And the Jews who come to discredit Paul cannot convince the Gentiles that Paul is not an apostle. He is. Look at the signs of an apostle being exercised. 
Acts 14, verse 4. But the multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews, and part with the apostles. Verse 14, Barnabas and Paul, the apostles. Some people have a problem with that Barnabas and apostle. Again, we aren't Bible correctors, we're Bible believers. If the our King James Bible says something, we don't argue. We just say, it's true. Whether we agree with it or not, whether professor, doctor, whoever believes it or not, I believe it. Okay. My preacher said, my priest said, my teacher said, my theology textbook, my Greek grammar, Hebrew grammar, Aramaic grammar. No. Those aren't our authority. Shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. If they are, toss them out. Or don't label yourself a Bible believer. Acts 13. Paul and Barnabas are sent ones, aren't they? You know what apostle means? Uh, sent one. Sent one. Acts 9. Paul was sent to the Gentiles. Jesus Christ commissioned him in Acts 9. Acts 14, 4. But the multitude of the city was divided, in part held with the Jews, in part with the apostles. Doctrine divides, doesn't it? Look at the rifts. Paul and Barnabas. Long time speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony to the word of His grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But verse 2, see, the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Look at the spiritual battle. God and Satan warring. Mm -hmm. God working through the apostles and Satan working through the flesh of unbelieving Jews. A long time has elapsed. To the point where half the city has sided with Paul and Barnabas and the other part has sided with the lost Jews. The hostility is escalating. Listen to these words. Thus, the Apostles' ministry at Iconium continued until the whole city was divided, part holding with the unbelieving Jews and part with Paul and Barnabas. So does the truth cause division wherever it goes. And those who would water down their God-given message so as not to cause division 
or simply unfaithful to their call. For our adversary, Satan, will always see to it that the truth is never preached unopposed. The Lord Jesus and the Apostle Paul were probably the greatest dividers of all history. Yet weak Christians will frequently condemn faithful men of God because their preaching causes division. Actually, of course, it is not the truth, but unbelief in the hearts of some that causes division. <laughs> How about that? Should I read it again? Thus the apostles' ministry at Iconium continued until the whole city was divided, part holding with the unbelieving Jews and part with Paul and Barnabas. So does the truth cause division wherever it goes, and those who would water down their God-given message so as not to cause division are simply unfaithful to their call. For our adversary will always see to it that the truth is never preached unopposed. The Lord Jesus and the Apostle Paul were probably the greatest dividers of all history. Yet weak Christians will frequently condemn faithful men of God because their preaching causes division. Actually, of course, it is not the truth but unbelief in the hearts of some that causes Division. We don't worry about doctrine. Doctrine divides. Instead, let's all gather around the love of Jesus. The ecumenical movement unite all the denominations, let's set aside our doctrinal differences and fellowship around Jesus. Well, whatever that means. The Bible is quite clear. We don't compromise with error, doctrinal error, false teachers. Romans 16, we avoid them, avoid them. 2 Corinthians 6, have no fellowship with them, be separate, withdraw thyself from them, 1 Timothy 6, leave them in their error. We do not sacrifice sound Bible doctrine for the sake of unity, ever. Ever. If we are not loyal to the scriptures rightly divided, we are not devoted to God, no matter what we say or what we claim to believe or what we assert we're doing. The way we love the Lord is we love His Word. Okay. Sound Bible doctrine. The Word of God rightly divided. We aren't. Church splitters for separating unto truth. The false teachers are the church splitters because they have departed to error. Acts 14. Acts 14, verse 5. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers, to use them despitefully, and to stone them. They were aware of it, and fled unto Lystra and Derbe. 
cities of Lycaonia, and unto the region that lieth round about. And there they preached the gospel. And a salt was made, both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews, with their rulers. <laughs> Remember, hatred for Jesus Christ unites strange bedfellows. The Jews and the Gentiles, they don't agree on anything, except we must eliminate Jesus' apostles. The Jews and the Gentiles hate each other with a passion, but here they have a mutual enemy. An assault. Assault. The Oxford English Dictionary. An act that threatens physical harm to a person, whether or not actual harm is done. That is assault. Read it again. Why, yes, I will. I'm glad you asked. An act that threatens physical harm to a person, whether or not actual harm is done. So the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers, religious leaders, evidently, to use them despitefully. Paul and Barnabas sense the mounting aggression. They're out to injure us. To treat them shamefully. Mistreat. Barnabas and Paul We're on the verge of being stoned. Stoned. Remember, according to the law of Moses, stoning was the Jewish mode of capital punishment. Stoning. They pick up rocks and throw them at the individual until the person was a pancake on the ground. Okay? We will recall John 5, John 8, John 10. Apostate Israel attempted to stone Jesus three times. That's what's recorded in the Bible. Possibly other times not in the Bible. You remember Stephen? Acts 7, he was stoned to death. Mm -hmm. That's what they planned for Paul and Barnabas. Mm -hmm. We'll get you to shut up then. You'll be dead. Barnabas and Paul will cause no more trouble for us. Acts 14, 6. They were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lycaonia, and unto the region that lieth round about, and there they preached the gospel. 
again they flee. They left Antioch of Pisidia, Jewish hostility. Now Iconium, they've departed. They flee to Lystra and Derby, cities of the region of Lycaonia. And that is in Galatia. Lystra and Derby. Lystra was 20 miles, 32 kilometers, southeast of Iconium. Day's journey. Derby was approximately 40 miles, 64 kilometers from Iconium. Two days journey. Paul and Barnabas are in Lystra and Derby. Seven. And there they preached the gospel, the good news. What gospel? Uh, the gospel of grace? 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, do you remember? Christ died for our sins, he was buried, he rose again the third day. Acts 20, 24, the gospel of grace. Acts 14, verse 8. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. A miracle of Paul. The Lord's miracle through Paul in Lystra. The impotent man. He's impotent in his feet. Potent. Potent means powerful, strong. M is a negation. As in M proper, not proper. So what does impotent mean? Not powerful, weak, weak. Not strong, disabled, handicapped, or Crippled. Powerless. Weak. Unable to walk. Impotent in his feet. He's a cripple from his mother's womb. He has never walked. This is a congenital Infirmity. Psalm 51 5. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. There's a hint. To grasp. The purpose of this passage in Acts 14. He has been incapacitated since birth. A cripple from his mother's womb. He's never walked. Acts 14.9, the same heard Paul speak. Who steadfastly beholding him, staring intently at him. Paul stares intently at the cripple. And perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. The 
the impotent man, the cripple in Lystra, heard Paul preaching. Paul fastens his eyes on him and perceives he understands that he had faith to be healed. How could Paul sense that? One Bible teacher was puzzled. How could Paul know that man had faith? You don't know if someone has faith or not. I will make an informed guess here. Perhaps, just perhaps, the Holy Spirit in Paul revealed to Paul this man had faith? Maybe so. There's nothing here about Paul perceived that he had great faith to be healed. No, it's faith. Faith. You either believe God's word or you don't. It's not, well, I believe some of it. Well, then, see, that's unbelief. Acts 14, 10. Paul said with a loud voice, he shouts, he exclaims to the cripple, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. Heal. Heal. Started walking. No physical therapy. No months of gradual strength. Just hold out and hold on, brother. God works in mysterious ways. You have some mobility. Good for you. Tomorrow you'll have a little more. And God will have you walking in a couple of weeks or months. Just keep hoping. No. The man leaped and walked. Okay, this is a miracle. This isn't a sham. Paul is not a charlatan of modern Christendom. This is a genuine miracle. Remember Acts 3? Who else healed a lame man? Uh, the Apostle Peter. Acts 3. You remember John 5, Jesus and the impotent man? Mm -hmm. That's a picture of Israel's kingdom restoration. New covenant blessings. Look at Acts 3. Remember what I told you already. What Peter did, Paul does. And there are several similarities between Peter and Paul. Here's one of them. One of many. Acts 3, 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, Jerusalem temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms, and Peter fasting his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us, and he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. 
And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Hmm? And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's greatly wondering. There's Peter's first miracle in the Bible. This is a picture of Israel's kingdom restoration. Peter's ministry is designed to bring Israel to a place of spiritual strength, health. They're sitting just outside of God's house, the temple, blessings the kingdom. Peter's ministry will enable Israel to enter the kingdom. See, what kingdom? Right here, right here. Now look, Paul heals a lame man. Now, there's nothing here about Israel's kingdom. This is a Gentile. Acts 14 is Paul's Gentile ministry. Okay. The crippled Gentile world. Impotent Gentile world. Without God, without Christ's earthly ministry, Without the Bible, Hebrew Bible, walking in their own ways. Acts 14, Acts 17, walking in ignorance. Romans 1, the Tower of Babel, the nations. Genesis 11. They are impotent. They have a sin nature. Psalm 51. From the mother's womb. Inherited from the Father. But God is reaching out to the Gentile world and can heal the Gentiles through Paul's ministry. You see it? You see it? Okay. Quite simple. I will read these verses. Without comment, I'm going longer than I wanted. All I will say is God is reaching the crippled Gentile world through Paul's ministry. Okay? Acts 26. Acts 26, 16. This is historically Acts 9. But rise and stand upon thy feet, Saul, Jesus talking. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Romans 9. Romans 9. This was Israel in time past. Romans 9. Who are Israelites, verse 4, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises? Who are the fathers and of whom is concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever? Amen. Now look at the Gentiles in time past. Well, hold on. Romans 11. Before we get to Ephesians. Romans 11. I say then, 11, have they stumbled that they should fall? Israel, 
God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Paul's acts provoking ministry to Israel. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness, kingdom restoration. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. Now Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. Verse 11. Gentiles in time past. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, earthly ministry, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, Paul's ministry, see, look, Time passed, but now? But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were for all, for made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who hath made both one, Jew and Gentile, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, circumcision versus uncircumcision, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain, two, Jew and Gentile, one new man, see, body of Christ, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, the Gentiles, and to them that were nigh, for through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. You can also read Ephesians 3, verses 1 through 11. You can read Colossians 1, verses 25 through 29. 1 Timothy 2. Well, do that. 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 7. God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. It's available to all, all Jews, all Gentiles. To be testified in due time, Paul is the due time testifier of Christ dying for all. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Acts 14, again, verse 8. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. Gentiles have access to Israel's God through the Apostle Paul's ministry. No longer under satanic influence, darkness, impotence. The Gentiles, the believers, are now fellowshipping with Israel's God by joining the church, the body of Christ, believing Paul's gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. And we finished. <laughs> Under two hours. So... We closed early. Thank you, Father God, for these scriptures. And may thou be glorified alone. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.